Since the start of the pandemic, foreign-based ransomware gangs have dramatically increased targeting of U.S. hospitals and health systems and their mission-critical service providers, with many becoming victim of high-impact ransomware attacks. These attacks have disrupted hospital business operations, delayed healthcare delivery, and risked patient safety, not only for the victim organization, but also for interconnected providers on a regional basis. It is essential that healthcare organizations understand the current cyber risk landscape and understand that high impact ransomware attacks will disrupt every business, clinical, and operational function in the organization, but that they can also brace for impact and prepare for recovery. Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast brought to you by the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hetterly with AHA Communications. Join us to hear insights from healthcare cybersecurity experts, including our own John Regi, who spent nearly 30 years as a highly decorated veteran of the FBI and now serves as National Advisor for Cybersecurity and Risk at the American Hospital Association and its more than 5,000 member hospitals. John and his expert colleagues will discuss how hospitals and health systems can create a stronger cybersecurity posture to protect their expanded networks, their data, and most importantly, their patients and the communities they serve. Thank you, Tom, and hello, everyone. This is John Regi, your National Advisor for Cybersecurity and Risk. High-impact, foreign-based ransomware attacks continue to disrupt life-critical, mission critical and business critical functions at hospitals and health systems in the US and across the globe. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has added to this global cyber threat as concerns mount over possible collateral damage from a Russian destructive cyber attack aimed at the Ukraine and possible cyber retaliation by the Russians against the West in response to our economic sanctions in support of Ukraine. So very pleased and privileged to have with me as my expert guests today, Brian O'Neill and Kathy Hughes from Northwell Health System. We will discuss how organizations can take proactive measures to mitigate the impact of these attacks, continue mission critical function safely, and accelerate recovery by integrating operational continuity planning with cyber incident response planning and emergency preparedness functions. First, a little bit about our guests in Northwell Health System. Brian O'Neill is the Vice President for Crisis Management for the Northwell Health System. In that role, he is responsible for business continuity, emergency management, and crisis management for all entities under the Northwell umbrella. Northwell is New York's largest provider of health care with 22 hospitals, over 850 ambulatory locations, and they are New York State's largest private employer with over 77,000 employees. Mr. O'Neill has been with Northwell Health for more than 28 years, starting out as a critical care paramedic. He's also been involved in EMS, emergency management, hospital leadership, ambulatory operations, and most recently assigned back on the health system's corporate leadership team, managing their crisis management program. Kathy Hughes is the vice president and Chief Information Security Officer at Northwell Health. In this position, she is responsible for overseeing the IT security technology, risk management, security governance, and disaster recovery teams. She also has responsibility for developing and implementing the IT security policies and standards, ensuring that appropriate tools and metrics are in place to allow for effective monitoring, measurement, and control of IT security risk. So again, Brian and Kathy, great to have you both here with me today. Brian, uh, as you know, I heard your podcast on your innovative approach to business continuity and preparedness for cyber attacks. And I thought this would be a great opportunity to get with you and Kathy and help promote the, as I said, the innovative work you're doing up there at Northwell. So thanks for sharing today. Brian, let's start with you. Can you give us a 30,000 foot description of how the Northwell emergency management structure integrates with the hospitals in your system? 
and how the IT security disaster recovery programs integrate with the emergency management structure. Well, thanks, John. I'm happy to be here on behalf of uh, Kathy and myself. Again, thank you very much for all the hard work you've been putting out and the information you've been sharing with all the providers. As far as Northwell Health, uh, at the corporate level many, many years ago, our CEO bought into emergency management planning from the onset. Mike Dowling has been very, very supportive of, of our role and the information security team. We currently have a full-time staff at corporate of 17 full-time employees that are regionally assigned to integrate with the hospitals. Each hospital has an emergency preparedness coordinator that's responsible for the day-to-day planning, training, and exercises, and our liaisons to the hospital from the corporate staff are subject matter experts that help push out templates, exercise design, act as a liaison and an incident management response entity whenever there's an activation at the hospitals. I'll let Kathy go through how the IT security component integrates with us and then with the hospitals. So thanks, Brian. Yeah, so Brian and I work very closely together and we really were integrated primarily through our, what we call our situation management team. Our situation management team is an extension of our service desk. Our service desk is where users would typically call for issues, problems, any kind of uh, help that they might need with any kind of IT service that we provide. So as part of that area, we have a situation management group which would get involved in, in dealing with any kind of incidents or events that are larger scale. And so we developed a framework around how we would, how the security team integrates with the situation management team and how Brian's crisis management team also integrates with that situation management team too, in case there are situations in the health system that involve IT systems versus what Brian traditionally deals with, which is you know an event happening at a hospital, a flood, a fire, something like that, that might affect local hospital operations. So we use that situation management team as kind of a bridge or a, 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 yeah, between our two teams. And uh, we work very collaboratively proactively. I mean, when I'm, the situation management teams is more of a reaction. If there is an issue or an incident, they would provide communications between IT and the hospitals through the crisis management organization. But proactively um, and preventively, Brian and I work together on doing things like business impact assessments. You know, we, we make sure that we're aligned on what essential services are and what the critical systems are. We make sure we have disaster recovery plans in, in place for that. So it's it's an evolving and it's maturing every day, but it really is a very collaborative uh, effort. And as uh, as Brian explained, that our CEO has really fully embraced, and Brian and I are really just the catalyst in making it happen and getting the word out because we are a very large organization and trying to get this program further evolved and developed and matured as time progresses. Thanks, Kathy, for that. You know, I'll just uh, focus on a couple of points that you made. One, this is a priority with the CEO, and clearly your CEO had the vision, the strategic vision, to understand the need for the business continuity function and how it will be necessary to have that function in place for all types of threats, whether they are physical threats, disasters, natural disasters, and cyber threats. So I think having the CEO buy-in, and and Brian, you can tell me, isn't isn't it uh, correct that your CEO established a, I think it was a chief continuity officer position. Is that correct? Yeah. So as uh, times dictate titles, Mike Dowling made it imperative that in the middle of COVID that he decided to modernize our emergency management program and took one of our senior vice presidents, who's the chief administrative officer at the time, Gene Tagney, and redefined his role and made his role into the chief continuity officer, which is normally seen in a Fortune 500 company not normally seen in a healthcare structure that you have a C-suite person at the system level, that sole responsibility is continuity. Agreed, Brian. As I travel the country, this is the first instance at Northwell where I have seen the position of a chief continuity officer. And I really think it's brilliant to have that position established. And also understanding the necessary connection between the emergency preparedness functions and the cybersecurity, incident response planning, and disaster recovery. I just came back from Louisiana and Puerto Rico. I did a total of three workshops. And in Louisiana and Puerto Rico, they understood that they often prepare for 
business interruptions and disasters related to hurricanes. And, and so in that sense, they had a head start, but had never really made the link between those plans and the cyber incident response plan. So I commend you all in your leadership for having the vision to do that. So moving on here, Brian, maybe back to you. What lessons learned throughout the pandemic, supply chain disruption, and now the geopolitical tensions in Eastern Europe have had you change your continuity and resiliency strategies? So I think one of the things that we learned from the pandemic was that you know the plausible scenarios are out the window. You know, similar to the response that uh, after Katrina, everybody changed their hurricane strategy. Now, after COVID, we've got to change other strategies like, you know, vendor disruption, supply chain interruption, and then take the whole component what's going on in the Ukraine that we're now up against terrorist states. So you really have to change and modernize your structure at that point in time. And again, with the leadership of the boss that he made it a priority. He, you know, he's someone that's hands on and is in the emergency operations center with our sites. He's walking the floors. He's out there. He understands this. He's been through ICS training with us. So he understands the impact of it. So we've been very fortunate that taking the lessons learned and a big part of it was that supply chain disruption component of it that, you know, PPE, you didn't know what was showing up and when it was. And then if it was showing up, was it being commandeered by the police or the feds at that point in time? So you had to have a lot of continuity plans, vendor continuity strategies, which has helped us change our contract language with vendors. So things like that, we, we had to modernize and we really had to get to a point where you have to be as self-sufficient as possible at the same time realizing that one vendor is not going to be enough to supply you've got to for every single thing you have be it medical supplies be it technology support whatever the case may be phones you've got to have vendor diversity thanks for that brian and before i turn it over to you kathy one comment on that i think is a very important point that you made having vendor continuity strategies the vendor then becomes a victim of a highly disruptive ransomware attack, for instance, and which then disrupts healthcare delivery potentially because the hospitals are relying on that vendor for some mission essential function. Kathy, um, your comments, uh, again, what lessons learned through the pandemic, supply chain disruption and geopolitical tensions? Sure, I think um, to your point, diversity is essential. You need to have that vendor diversity you need to be always thinking what if, and, and you have to always be thinking worst case. And what we've learned from the pandemic and all the other supply chain disruptions and all the geopolitical tensions is that you have to be prepared not only for a short-term incident, but also a long-term incident. Because what we're seeing, especially with cyber attacks, is that organizations are impacted not for hours or days, but potentially weeks or months. And it's a new mindset that that in healthcare has never had to really address before because it was always planning for some type of system upgrade. You knew the systems were going to come down for a period of time. The clinical areas had to revert to downtime procedures, but they were back up online within a few hours. Or if there was any kind of hardware issue, you know, it could be easily replaced typically within a day, you know, no more than a day. So, you know, Brian and I have really been trying to create that awareness and an education that you need to be prepared not only for the hours or days, but for longer term. And, you know, what would you do? How would you continue to operate if your IT systems were not available for an extended period of time? And on the flip side of that, from a disaster recovery point of view, because that's the area I'm most responsible for. Although we might have the capability technically to bring systems online pretty quickly, it takes a lot of time to figure out what happened, how did the threat actor get in, is there anything looming out there that needs to be addressed? So you, you can't necessarily, you can't bring systems back online anytime quickly until that analysis has been completed and all the remediation um, has not only been done, but validated. And then there's all the backloading of data and synchronizing of systems. So it's an extended period of time. So this can be an extended period of time. So this is something that Brian and I have really been trying to get the, uh, the, the different areas of the hospital to focus on because of these events that have taken place over the past two years. Yeah. And Kathy, to expand on your last point, no one had ever expected previously to these high impact ransomware attacks to be offline for weeks and months. Unfortunately, we have many uh, case studies now that show that 
mission critical systems are usually offline for up to three to four weeks, just the mission critical functions and then other business functions taking even longer to restore. And ultimately, another point you made is your your role in one of these type of attacks is to restore the technology, but it's not your role to determine how do we deliver a cancer treatment when we've lost the access to the electronic medical record? How do we how do we conduct imaging and radiology without access to that technology? Clearly mission essential functions. Brian, so on that, how do you define mission essential functions? So I think the easiest way to say is that the mission essential functions are the must-haves. Those functions or services that we as an organization must have. You know, we want to make sure that we maintain our mission, and that mission is patient care. So what are the things that provide the ability for us to provide that mission essential patient care? And we bucket them in three different ways. Kathy's team, my team, and a lot of clinicians have worked hard on this to really focus on this and to give feedback to the end users as as to how they sit in this thought process. So if patient care is the mission essential function, for example, well, respiratory therapy would be a supportive function to the mission essential. They, uh, They get very sensitive when you say, oh, you know, respiratory therapy is not a mission essential. No, it's a supportive function to the mission essential service that's being provided. Interesting. Kathy, any perspective on that? Yeah, I mean, I can't really speak from a a business continuity perspective, but from a DR perspective, you know, what's mission essential to to me and to what I need to do and to bring up IT systems is to make sure that our key systems and services that are required, regardless of what systems might be impacted by an event, you know, things like Active Directory, DHCP, DNS, our our integration engines, you know, there's a host, there's a a handful, I should say, of, of systems and services that have to always, always be available regardless of the incident. And we have to have the ability to bring them up because without them, we can't bring anything up. And because you don't know in advance what may or may not be impacted, you know, we have identified certain services and applications as mission essential functions that need to be provided from an IT perspective. And so we focus on those. We have we call those uh, tier zero applications, the ones that always have to be on. And then from there, where we have tier one and we go up through tier four, tier one is where I align what Brian has defined as those critical functions, the business and clinical and financial and all those other types of functions. I align them to systems to make sure that we have the appropriate resiliency plans and strategies in place so that if there was an event of some type, we know what to bring up first. We They help us set the priorities on the systems and we make sure that the resiliency is baked into uh, the solutions that are providing those services and functions. Thanks for that, Kathy. So it's pretty clear that those tier zero functions that you mentioned are really the foundational technology that for anything else to work, those systems have to be restored first. But as you mentioned, you also have to make sure that the cyber adversary, the bad guy, is out of your network before you restore. And of course, you have to still understand how they penetrated the network and has had that vulnerability been uh, corrected. So let me move on here to the next uh, question. When and where does business continuity take place? Who owns it? And what type of governance models do you have in place? Uh, Brian, let me go over to you for that one. All right, so I'll start with it. So we have at the corporate level, we have a business continuity strategy steering committee, which is chaired by Sophie Liu, who is our chief information officer, and my boss, Gene Tagney, the chief continuity officer. On that committee, myself, Kathy, internal audit, nursing informatics staff, clinical informatic physicians, regional operations executives, our CFO. So that's what sets the strategy. And that strategy drives how we work with our administrative shared services, with our clinical teams in the hospitals and the clinical teams in the ambulatory side of it. So from a standpoint of who owns it, it's owned by operations. And, you know, always in the past you hear, oh, that's IT's issue, that's IT's issue. Now, nah, this is a, an operational function. This is how you continue that operation. And we, we make sure that that's the culture that we've created and put throughout. We provide templated strategies at the steering committee level that we're going to push out to shared services, to the hospitals, and to the ambulatory services. Most of the plans themselves reside with the department level emergency operations. 
So the site emergency preparedness coordinator, or if it's someone from my team working on shared services, coordinates with the site specific director and does the continuity planning at the unit level. So it's almost down to the unit level to make sure that the information starts locally and it is basically built at that local level, exercised at that level. Yeah, that's a great point, Brian, and I think a great strategy because ultimately the plans have to be executed at the local level, right? It's those frontline clinicians that have to continue to deliver uh, care and are also responsible for patient safety. Again, they're the ones that have to actually manually do those downtime procedures. Kathy, I'm going to move on to you for the next question. How have you integrated information security in emergency management to better prepare for cyber incident response? So we have a, an incident response plan. And in that plan, we have identified the different roles and responsibilities that folks would assume if there was any type of an event. And of course, the emergency management uh, group is a big part of that. But they're only one part of it. There's many other departments that are involved in this. You know, we have our corporate compliance and our risk management group and our shared services group, our procurement, you know, because all of those, uh, all of those different areas would need to be involved if there was any kind of significant cyber event that affected systems at the health system. So we are integrated, you know, with all of them and we conduct both um, technical exercises as well as executive exercises with senior leadership from each of those different areas that would play a role if there was any type of cyber uh, incident. So as far as the response goes, you know, we would also make sure that we coordinated very closely with whatever third party vendor, cybersecurity vendor we would engage uh, to help, as well as with law enforcement and a host of other external partners that we've already identified. And, the, you know, collaboration and um, knowing that every circumstance that happens is unique and different and there's uh, there's guidelines, but it's not like a tried and true, this is the step every time if something happens that you would follow. So flexibility and, and getting people engaged and involved and mon monitoring the situation and adjusting with the emergency management group is, is key to making sure that the incident is um, as contained and responded to as, uh, as quickly as possible. Yeah, thanks for that, Kathy. Clearly, flexibility and adaptability are key in any situation. Having been involved in many, many law enforcement operations, we all understand you can only plan for so many contingencies, and ultimately, you're going to have to adapt to whatever's presented to you. Brian, I'm going to move on to, uh, to you here for the next question. How would you recommend to our colleagues to move the continuity planning process forward at their institution what successes and roadblocks have you hit? So one of the things that's been tremendously helpful for us, as I've said, has been the buy-in from the CEO. And that helps tremendously drive a lot of our strategy in the health system. But again, you still have competing priorities. So you have to get into the hospitals and work with them, clearly define the project. And I have our emergency management guys that are the liaison to the hospitals trained as project managers, because that's really what we're helping, helping the sites do, facilitate moving that ball down the field to really focus on those planning exercises to focus on that department level training department level planning so they work as project managers but by identifying the project identifying the risks to the leadership of the hospitals showing them what the process what the regulatory impl implications are as some has changed with joint commissions change to july 1 and then the operational impact of not doing this I think a big part of it, it has been the ability to get the hospital execs on board is by hearing from their peers. You know, a case in point, we, we, we had a, a uh, technology interruption one Thursday night in December. We then at the next hospital operations meeting had that exec come in and tell her peers exactly what they went through. And then we have the ability to show information from other hospitals, University of Vermont or Wyckoff or, or ECMC, who went through an incident and how long it took them to recover. And, and University of Vermont put out a very good timeline about the time it took. And once you show this, a lot of light bulbs go off in the audience. And it's been tremendously helpful for us. But clearly defining the project, 
and the time frame that you're looking at with them has gotten tremendous buy-in for us. So it's been tremendously helpful. Yeah, thanks for that, Brian. And I'm glad you mentioned University of Vermont Medical Center. The CEO, Dr. Leffler, has worked with us here at AHA to, to help disseminate lessons learned and really uh, certainly serves as an excellent case study for business continuity and business impact analysis in the integration of emergency preparedness with cyber incident response plan. Kathy, I'm going to go on to you here as we're approaching the time here on the uh, podcast. At Northwell Health, what is the difference between disaster recovery plans and business continuity plans, and who owns and maintains them? Yeah, and I think there's a, a very common uh, misperception of the difference between the two because many folks inherently think they're one and the same. A disaster recovery plan is really the technical plan that would be followed to bring an IT system up someplace else. That's really what a DR plan is, and it's making sure that you understand the interdependence, system dependencies and interdependencies and, and systems that need to be brought up in what order and priority. It, it's very important to make sure that that's documented, and that's what would be in a disaster recovery plan. A business continuity, and that's owned by the IT or the IS department. The business continuity plan, um, as Brian said, those are really owned by the departments that need to provide that function or service. And this is kind of a cultural, I guess, evolution, I guess, that we're, we're embarking upon now is, is it's getting that understanding out there that they are responsible for maintaining their operations should their IT systems not be available and to be thinking not only about the short term, but also the long term. So they own the plans, they're responsible for exercising them, again, with the governance structure that Brian described and that senior governance group that he also described to kind of oversee the whole program. That is a great point, again, that you made, is that understanding by the department heads, by the business leaders, or really I call them the clinical leaders, that they own the plans on how to continue care. Your job is to restore the technology but not to determine how to deliver cancer treatment or get those uh, labs read. Brian, back to you for any final thoughts on this question here at, at uh, what is the difference between disaster recovery plans and a business continuity plan from your perspective and who owns and maintains them? Well, I think Kathy hit the nail on the head with a lot of this is the misperception over the years of that, you know, they were one and the same and they're not. You know, Kathy brought up that the disaster recovery component is truly that IT infrastructure rebuild. And the business continuity is the operational mindset and tools that they're going to need to maintain the mission essential functions. One term that we also tie into this is the, the phrase downtime procedures. And the hospitals always refer to, oh, downtime, that's IT's responsibility. No, downtime procedures are owned by operations and the clinical entities have to own them. IT provides technological solutions during downtime. They don't own downtime. Operations owns downtime. And I look at our role as emergency managers as being the ones that facilitate the planning and the exercises to work through downtime. But the operations people own downtime and own business continuity. Thanks for that, Brian. Well, I think we're at the top of the session here. And Kathy and Brian, I can tell you're both very passionate about what you do. And thankfully so, because by you joining us today and sharing your tremendously valuable knowledge and innovative strategy, this will no doubt help the nation's hospitals and health systems prepare for, respond to, and recover from high impact cyber attacks, ultimately helping defend care delivery and patient safety. For our listeners, if you would like the latest cyber threat information from the government and the HISAC, please visit us at www.aha.org backslash cybersecurity. And again, especially thank you to all our healthcare heroes listening today. Thank you for all your dedicated service and sacrifice to care for our patients and our communities. Again, Kathy and Brian, thank you. This has been John Regi, your National Advisor for Cybersecurity and Risk. Stay safe, everyone.